All right, we'll be in verse 1. And it says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is a victory overcome the world, our faith, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You can, you may be seated. <laughs> Give me a second. All right. So I just wanted to talk about what it says in verse 3. It says, for this is the love of God, that we keep in his commandments. And what I think this means when we say believing in the God, that we could, that he watched over us and protect us if we believe in him. I also think that if we stay in his commandments and stay away from sin, that it would keep us from sinning and make each of our lives better each day. If we also have our faith in him, we would believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he is the father of us and that we are child of God. They don't know what else to talk about. <laughs> well, I guess we'll keep reading, so we'll be in verse 6 now. So, so it says, This is who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood, and not the Spirit. It who bears witness because the Spirit is truth, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the world, Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are agreeing as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God. Oh. Which he has testified of his son, who he he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God that made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son, and that this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is his son, in his son. He who has the son of life, he does, hold on, he does, who, who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Amen. I praise, praise the Lord for Hayden today, his boldness and courage to come and stand uh, before people today to share a portion of the Word of God. And I'm thankful that he opened up the door. I'm thankful that the Holy Ghost of God used him uh, to open up the door to this passage of Scripture today because this is paramount. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is what we're called to do uh, as the body of Christ, the church, the family of God. Uh, as, as you look in this passage of Scripture, especially in John's epistle, uh, it is John who called himself uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Loved. Uh, and we're talking about the fact that we have the, the ability and the power uh, to love uh, one another even as he has loved us. Now, where do we get this power from? Uh, he read about it when he went on down through verse 6 uh, and he talked about the power and the witness uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, because the Holy Ghost of God uh, resides within each, you know, within each one of us uh, as a born-again believer. And you can't love people uh, except the Spirit of God in you uh, love people. I'm going to tell you about some difficult people today. I'm going to talk to you about some people today, 
my friend, that's hard to love uh, because not everybody uh, is easy to love. If it was easy uh, to give, give the love of God to everybody, uh, then we wouldn't have no problems uh, and we wouldn't see the problems that we have uh, in the church, uh, in the world, uh, in our homes, uh, at the workplace, uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, but it is the love of God uh, that we are commanded uh, to give uh, one to another. Uh, I want to ask you a question as we dive off into this passage of Scripture today. Uh, are you in uh, the faith? Uh, I'm not asking you, do you have faith today? Uh, I'm asking you, are you in uh, the faith? Uh, do you believe? Uh, how do you know uh, that you're in the faith? Uh, John tells us three things uh, in this first epistle uh, that lets us know uh, that we are the children of God, uh, that we are the sons uh, and the daughters of God. Uh, we are the family of God. First of all, uh, we got our theology right. Uh, we believe on the name uh, of the Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, because there is no other name under heaven given by which men can be saved uh, but that name. Uh, you want to go to heaven? Uh, you got to believe on Jesus Christ. Uh, you want to have your sins forgiven? Uh, you got to believe on Jesus Christ. Uh, you got to know that he went to the cross, laid down his life for your sins, uh, rose from the dead on the third day, uh, conquered death, hell, and the grave, uh, and you, my friend, uh, can have uh, eternal life. Second of all, John tells us uh, that if we live a moral, righteous life, uh, that doesn't mean uh, that that saves us. Uh, that just gives evidence in our life uh, that we have been saved, that we have been born again, that our life has been changed uh, because we're no longer walking in darkness, uh, but we're walking in light. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 6, uh, we're no longer slaves to sin, uh, but we're slaves to righteousness. Uh, Jesus put it like this uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is what Jesus said. Uh, he said, a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, uh, and an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Uh, he said, you'll know a tree uh, by the fruit that it bears. The third thing to know that you are in the faith is right here. And it really begins in verse 7 of chapter 4. But I want to read to you verse 18, verse 20 and 21 of chapter 4. The Bible says, uh, if someone says, I love God uh, and hates his brother, he's a liar. <laughs> he said, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment uh, we have from him uh, that he who loves God uh, must uh, love his brother also. Back up chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible said, we know that we have passed from death to life. You know that you pass uh, from being unforgiven to being forgiven, uh, from sin to righteousness, uh, from being a, uh, bound by the enemy uh, to being set free in Christ Jesus. Hey, he said, because uh, we love the brethren. He said, he who does not love his brother abides uh, in death. Now listen to me. I know some of you out there going, well, well preacher, uh, who, who is my brother? Because uh, you kind of sound like the lawyer who come to Jesus uh, in Luke's Gospel chapter 10. Uh, and the lawyer came to Jesus and said, tell me, what must I do to have eternal life? Uh, and Jesus said, uh, love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Uh, and love your neighbors yourself, uh, and you shall live. Uh, do this, and you shall live. Uh, and the man said, well, uh, trying to justify himself before Jesus, uh, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Jesus tells the story uh, of a man who was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, uh, fell among thieves. They stripped him of his raiment, uh, left him naked, beaten and bloody on the side of the road. Uh, the Bible said he was half dead. Uh, the Bible said a priest and a Levite, uh, both of them fellow Jews, uh, both of them brother Jews, uh, to the man beaten and on the side of the road, uh, passed by on the other side. But the Bible says uh, that there was one who was a Samaritan, uh, a certain Samaritan who passed that way, uh, who when he saw him, uh, went over to him, uh, put bandages on him, poured in oil and wine, uh, put him on his own beast, uh, took him down to Jericho, put him up in the inn. Uh, the next day when he left, uh, he gave the innkeeper two denarii. Uh, and what he said, uh, he said, uh, take care of him till I come again. If I owe you more, uh, I'll pay you more. He looked at the lawyer uh, and said, tell me uh, who he is. Uh, his neighbor. He said, I guess the one who took care of him. I guess the one who demonstrated uh, his love toward him. Because the lawyer tried to justify himself because there were some people he wanted to love and then there were some people he really didn't want to love. 
There were some people that he wanted uh, to help, but there were some people he really didn't want to help. And he had a hard time determining who his neighbor is. Uh, and I think they some Christian people uh, who got a hard time determining uh, who their brother is. Because the brother in Christ don't always look like you. He don't act like you. He don't dress like you. He don't go where you go. He don't always do what you do. He don't think like you all the time. He don't even believe everything like you believe it. He don't sing the songs you sing sometimes. He don't read from the same version of the Bible that you read from sometimes. He may not even go to the same church that you go to. But nonetheless, he's still our brother in Jesus Christ. Amen. We are the family of God. And we are commanded commanded did you hear verse 21 of chapter 4 he said we must he said there's no exception he said this is a non-negotiable when it comes to identifying with Jesus Christ racism and Christianity do not harbor in the same heart I didn't tell you racists couldn't be saved I just told you that a racist whenever they got saved wouldn't be a racist anymore You say, well, preacher, why is that? Because God is no respecter of person. That means that God don't care if you red, yellow, black, or white. He don't care if you blue, green, or brown. He don't care. And he commands that we love. Now, where did John get this principle, this commandment from? Because John wrote to John's gospel. He wrote uh, 1, 2, and 3, John epistles. And he wrote the book of Revelation. But John had heard this somewhere. He had got this from a reputable source (laughs) because he had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And in the discourse up in the upper room on the Thursday night before Jesus was crucified on Friday, in John's Gospel chapter 13, (laughs) Jesus laid it down for his disciples because he knew he was going away and he knew uh, that this was a foundational principle, uh, a foundational pillar uh, for the church, uh, the body of Christ. Now listen to me. If there's one thing that I, I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, be a part of and, and blessed to be a part of, it's a body of Christ, a local body of fellowship that wants to make a difference in other people's lives. That's what I can truly say. We are blessed as a people to come together and have a common vision. And that common vision is to reach in our community and be a blessing to those that are in need to provide even the basic needs of a human being. When you think about basic needs, you think about water, you think about food, you think about shelter, you think about clothing. But we oftentimes think about helping people get back on their feet again. We think about helping people get a job. We think about helping people have a better life. But most importantly, uh, it's about introducing people uh, to Jesus Christ, uh, the very bread of life, uh, the living water uh, of which they can come uh, and know uh, and have uh, eternal life. Now listen to me. But one thing we seldom ever fail to that we seldom fa- that we fail to see as the body of Christ is that we fail to see one of the greatest needs of all, and is that people need. To be loved. Listen to me. They need to feel a connection. They need to feel like they belong somewhere. And they are part of something that's bigger than their life. Because, listen to me, that's how this church was started. That's how this church was birthed. If any of you know anything about Jacob's well, it was birthed out of a nonprofit. The nonprofit is the umbrella of which the church is under because this, because we were helping people trying to meet their needs, provide for them, and we saw that the people that were ministering and the people that were being ministered to needed a place to come together to belong because we all are the family of God. Because in the family of God, 
the rich man must love the poor man. And the poor man must love the rich man. The man in the big house has to love the man in the subsidized housing. And the man in the subsidized housing has to love the man in the big house. Some of you ain't going to like this, but the Republican brother has to love the Democratic brother. And the Democratic brother has to love the Republican brother. I'm trying to tell you today, we have got to love one another even as he loved us. Now watch this. John's Gospel 13. This is where John heard it. The Bible says in verse 34, And a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I also have loved you, that you also love one another by this. All will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. You know, that, that term, that phrase, one another, is in the, in the New Testament over 60 times. We find that when it comes to the family of God, the body of Christ, uh, it tells us how we are to bear uh, one another's burdens. <laughs> how we are to pray uh, one uh, for another. How we are to encourage uh, one another. Uh, how we are to have fellowship, uh, connectivity, uh, and community uh, with uh, one another. But you ain't never going to do any of that until you first love one another like he loved us. Amen. Now, let's get real. Because it's one thing to say, I love you. And love is a language because we hear people write poems about it. And they write songs about it. And they recite and they sing about this thing called love. But let me tell you something. It's more than just words that come out of your mouth. Love is more than a feeling. The problem is so many people base their love on their feelings. And if I feel like loving you today, I'm going to love you today. But if I don't feel like loving you today, then you just out of luck. Because I don't really feel like evoking that kind of love into your life. First of all, you done, well, I started to say something, but you done made me mad. <laughs> I to catch myself sometimes. Thank you, Jesus. Because you done made me mad, and I, I really don't care nothing about sharing love with you. I really got something else I want to tell you, and I really want to give you a piece of my mind, and I really want to let loose on you. But you have to realize that love is not something you control. It's something that controls you. The reason that so many people cannot love like God says that we're supposed to love, we must love, that we have to love, is because so many people are like the Dead Sea. You say, preacher, what do you mean? You know why it's called the Dead Sea? Well, first of all, there's nothing in it, but that ain't the reason it's called dead so much so as the fact that it comes in but nothing goes out. The Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is so rich in minerals that you can walk out into the Dead Sea and the buoyancy of the water will not allow you to sink. You don't need a float. You don't need a life vest. You don't need a chair. All you got to do is just bend back and you will float. If you ain't never floated before, you will float in the Dead Sea. It's called the Salt Sea and it's so rich in minerals but the reason there's no life in it is because there's nothing flowing out of it. The Bible said in Jeremiah chapter 2, this is what God said. He said, I have two, you have committed two evils against me. He said, you got two sins that are against me. First of all, you've forsaken the fountain of living waters and you've hewed you out cisterns, which are broken cisterns that contain no water at all. Understand. A cistern was something they dug to catch the rainwater. And whenever it stopped raining, that was the water they had. 
and it was stale and it was stagnant and it became a pool of which they would draw water from and have to uh, have to boil that water in order for it to be safe to drink or to use. But what I need to tell you today that God wants to see some outflow out of your life. God wants to see and commanded uh, that we love one another. Uh, and this ain't always easy. It's not convenient. Uh, it's not comfortable. Uh, if, if we could just love people that love us, man, that would be just, that's what I'm talking about, God. Just surround me with people that love me. Uh, and then it will be so much easier uh, to love those people. Uh, but God will often surround us uh, with difficult people to love. People that get on your next nerve. People that you like, uh, I, I, Lord, today's the day. I'm being tested, God. Lord, I need your grace. I need some mercy up in here, Lord. You know, you know my temper can't stand this, God. I'm fixed to go off on these people right here. But you are commanded to love one another even as you have been loved. Now listen to this. What, what happens when we love one another. If you look back in verse 31 and 32 of John's gospel, chapter 13, this is what this is what the Bible says. He said, now the son of man is glorified. This is Jesus talking. Now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. That's a whole lot of glorifying going on, ain't it? And two verse five times he talks about glorifying. He said, preacher, what does it mean to glorify? It means to promote. It means to advertise. It means to put out front, okay? This is what he's saying. He's saying when you love one another, you put God up front. You put Jesus on the billboard. You put it out there that you are a disciple. A disciple of Jesus Christ ain't because you come to church. It ain't because you got a big old Bible you towed under your arm. It ain't because you can quote some scriptures. It's because you love one another. And that's how you know that you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you have love. One for another. Now listen. He said, but it allows us to glorify God like we can do in no other way. This is the greatest way that you can glorify God. When you love people that are in the body of Christ. Now that don't mean just the people you sit with. That don't mean the people on your road. That means the people on the other side of the church, and that's why you're sitting on this side of the church, because you don't like the people on the other side of the church, and so you... Ain't it amazing? Have you ever been riding down the road, the highway of life, and you go by a billboard, and you pass a billboard, pass a billboard, you ain't paying no attention to the billboard. I mean, they're just strung up and down on 75. You ain't paying no attention. And finally, you look at a billboard, and you see a billboard, and it kind of catches your attention. But there are certain billboards, there's certain signs that whenever they see you, I don't know about you, but whenever that I see them, they just grab hold to me. And they, they make the car go like that. And I'm like, oh, yes, hallelujah. Does anybody know what sign I'm talking about? It does like this. It says, hot. <laughs> it's in the window of Krispy Kreme donuts. And whenever I'm riding down the road, Brother Larry, and that thing's flashing hot, oh, my God, my car, he just like, whoo, right into the parking lot. If you happen to go by it, it'll make a U-turn right there in the middle of the highway. Turn around and come back to it uh, because there's something about that sign uh, that compels me uh, to want some of it. They ought to be something in your life. They ought to be a sign uh, of how you love the brethren, how you love one another that compels people uh, to turn in here. Uh, I don't want to be a church uh, that's known because we got the latest and the greatest in the technology. Uh, I don't want you to come to church just to receive a word uh, and leave. Uh, I want you to come to the body of Christ uh, and be a part of the family of God uh, because we love uh, one another uh, like we have uh, been loved. Amen. That's the testimony. That's who we are. 
That's why we do what we do. It's on the wall, people. It ain't up there just because we thought that was a good verse. We put it on the wall. It says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor. Love God and love people. That's our life verse. That's who we are. That's what we believe. And if you're going to come to this church and you're going to be a part of this body of Christ, that's what you're going to have to do. Because I'm going to talk to you. Because it's a bad witness. And it's a bad representative. It's a poor ambassador for Christ when you don't love the brethren. When you don't love one another. Because it's a commandment from God. Now listen. The Bible says in verse 34, he said, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you uh, and that you also love one another. By this all, who's going to know? Some, a few, a lot, all. Because this is your reputation. This is your witness. Uh, this is your testimony in Jesus Christ. Uh, listen to me. Uh, away with this long range of Christianity. That's a ridiculous mess anyway. Amen. Like you're going to be a Christian and never be a part of the body of Christ. Like you're going to walk it out by yourself and do it on your own and get there. Uh, listen to me. The reason, uh, listen to me, God's plan is culminated uh, in the church, uh, the body of Christ. How you going to know? He didn't say love yourself. He didn't say love your four no more. Well, I'm just going to stay at home. I'm taking care of my family. I'm taking care of everybody. I'll get in. I'm, I'm going to love my family. We all going to go to heaven together. What about the rest of these people? What about the family of God? What about getting plugged into the body of Christ and being who God called you to be uh, and using the gifts and the talents and the abilities uh, that God gave you to lose uh, so that you can love one another uh, like Jesus uh, loved you? This is agape love, somebody. I'm talking about this is big love. This ain't erotic, erosive. This ain't sensual kind of love. This ain't, this, ain't, uh, this ain't filio. This ain't friendship kind of love. This is that sacrificial, unconditional, selfless kind of love. Agape love is when you consider somebody else ahead of yourself. It's whenever you got somebody else's best interest at heart. You ain't thinking about you and what you can gain and what you can get and how this is going to bless you uh, and how this is going to help you uh, because we got this selfish, uh, self-absorbed mentality uh, that's been given to us by the culture uh, of this world. Uh, but we got to take that and cast it off uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, and we, uh, by the Spirit of God, uh, have got to love one another uh, just like we have been loved. Now listen to me. We glorify him when we love one another. But there's some things that happen in our walk with him whenever we love one It ain't just that we glorify him. We get blessed because of it too. Watch this. Go back to 1 John. I, I promise you I'm going to sit down in a minute. We all going to go to Craig and Chastis. Look what he said, because he shows us three things that happen for us when we love one another like he loves us. You say, preacher, uh, I, I've, been, I've been wanting to get closer to God. Love one another. <laughs> love one another. You say, preacher, how's that going to help me get closer to God? Read 1 John 4 and 8. The Bible says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So you say, Preacher, I just want to know more about God. I want to experience more God. I want God to be more at work in my life. Then you need to start loving one another. 
Because when you love one another, you do what God is. Let me say that one more time. When you love one another, you do what God is. If you want to open the door of your life and open the door of your heart and receive more of the person and the power of God in your life, you need to start loving one another. You say, well, preacher, I love most of them. I didn't, the Bible don't say love most of them. The Bible said love all of them. All of them. You say, well, preacher, I, I'm just not sure they're a child of God. How are you going to justify yourself above them? How are you going to act like you're a child of God and they ain't a child of God because you see something in their life that you don't like, huh? but maybe they see something in your life that they don't like. This ain't about loving people that reciprocate love to you. This is about loving people. Listen to me. Do you know who Jesus loved? Jesus loved his mama. <laughs> he said, I love my mama. Preacher, I say, praise the Lord. He said, Jesus loved his, he loved his earthly father, Joseph. He loved him. He loved his brothers and his sisters, half-brothers, half-sisters. He loved them. He loved his disciples. Man, I mean, he loved Matthew. He loved Bartholomew. He loved Thomas. Can I tell you that he loved Peter, the one who denied him three times? Can I tell you that he loved the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, the high priests, that he loved them? Can I tell you that he loved the Roman soldiers who nailed him to a cross? Uh, can I tell you that he loved the one who put the spear in his side? Uh, can I tell you that he loved the one who put the crown of thorns on his head uh, and flogged him and beat him with a cat of nine tails? Uh, can I tell you that he loved uh, even uh, Judas? Now, you're going to tell me why you can't love them. There ain't nothing. You need to get over it. Amen. That's what you need to do. Because you letting that get in the way of you walking on in the power of God. Look what the Bible says. He said, God is love. <laughs> and then he said in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. This is what perfect love does, mature love. Now, you know you don't love right if you love immature because then you pick and choose who you want to love. But if you have mature love, that means that you love anybody and everybody. But he said, this is what happens when you have perfect love or mature love. It casts out fear. Now, what does that mean? It means that what is the opposite of fear is peace. You remember when he was in the ship with the disciples and they woke him up and said, Cares not thou that we perish? They were scared to death. He said, why are you so afraid? He said, why are you so fearful? What did he do? He got up and stood on the bow of the ship and he said, peace. Be still, and the winds and the waves obeyed. So fear is the opposite of peace, and peace is the opposite of fear. So whenever love, perfect love, drives out fear, all of a sudden you get peace like you've never had it before. You say, preacher, what does that mean? That means that if you need some peace in your life, If you find yourself in a place where there's division and contention and strife uh, and chaos and confusion uh, and disorder and things are disrupted, uh, if I'm talking about your house, uh, if I'm talking about your marriage, uh, if I'm talking about your workplace, uh, if I'm talking about your neighborhood, uh, if I'm talking about your church, uh, then bless God, uh, you need to love uh, one another like you've been loved. Uh, and that perfect love uh, will drive out fear. Uh, and then the peace of God uh, that passes all understanding uh, will see Sit down on your mind uh, and your heart. Uh, it will flood your soul. Uh, rise up in your spirit uh, and you shall uh, overcome. Good God Almighty. The peace. Come on, I don't know my chew boy, but that's priceless right there. Peace. But whenever we love one another like we're supposed to love one another, Look back up here. Verse 21, chapter 3. 
He said, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things with, that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment. He didn't just tell you we keep his commandments. He said this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So if we keep his commandments, then whatever we ask, we will receive. You say, preacher, I've been praying about this thing and praying about this thing and praying about this thing. And it just feels like my prayers ain't going nowhere. They feel like they're hitting the ceiling, falling back down. feel like there's an iron curtain up there, and I ain't getting, this, ain't getting, getting through to God. It's just like God ain't even hearing me. I don't hear no answer. I don't feel nothing. I don't sense nothing. I don't perceive nothing. I, I'm just wondering, preacher, what's wrong? Maybe there's somebody you need to love that you ain't loving. Because when you love one another like you've been loved, then all of a sudden, the windows of heaven begin to open up. And God inclines his ear to hear our prayers. And what we ask of God, he is well able to do. And God will move on our behalf. But it begins when we love one another. So if you want your prayers answered, and you want God to do what you can't do, then you better love one another even as you have been loved. <laughs> one more thing. I told you I'm going to sit down. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 4, this is what he said. Verse 8, and above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. He said, have fervent love one for another. And that love will cover a multitude of sins. You, you want your sins covered? <laughs> Do you want your sins covered? <laughs> because this is what he's saying. He said, whenever you love with a fervent love, like the love that God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ, when you love like that, he said, that kind of love, he said, will cover a multitude of sins. And what he's saying by that is that that kind of love will release you From the hurt of your past. From the pain and the regret of what you've done and what's been done to you. Some of us are captive this morning. Some of us are bound up in a spiritual prison today. Because we have not loved one another. The key, the key to unlock the door to the spiritual prison that the devil wants to hold you captive in is when you love one another like you have been loved. You said, preacher, you've said that a bunch of times. And I heard it the first time you said it. Well, I'm glad you did. Because now it's on you. Amen. And it ain't on me. Amen. Hayden did a gracious job and a great job. Of presenting to us what loving God and loving people really look like. Right 
What's your love look like? Bible said in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 that God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us yeah. that that's the demonstration that's the proving point of God's love it was Jesus on the cross Jesus being sacrificed Jesus hanging naked between the heavens and the earth Jesus stretched wide and hung high. That is God's demonstration of love to us. Does anybody know that you love them? I'm not asking you when was the last time you told them that you love them. When was the last time you demonstrated that you love them? Because we're talking about giving and not receiving. But if you have received, then you can't help but give. If it comes in, it can't help but flow out. It's our identity. It's what gives us our name. It's why we are who we are. It's why we do what we do. It is the love of God.